warn you in advance that some of the content in this series may be offensive at times, but that's okay because growth at times requires growth pains. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of God-given destiny. It's time to mature. So get ready for mature audiences only. Good morning, Calvary Church. Do me a favor. Will you just stand to your feet and give God a praise for about 15 seconds? Because the creator of the entire universe decided he was going to start living at your home address. In fact, he made you the temple of the living God. He's not just with you. He's in you. And if that excites you, I want you to lift up your voice and give God a shout of praise. Say thank Thank you, Jesus, for living on the inside of me. And then do me a favor. Just point to about three or four people before you sit down and say, he lives at your house too. Go ahead and tell her. Come on. Come on. My goodness, I feel like preaching today. Good morning, Calvary Church. Boy, it's good to see so many smiling faces. Boy, I tell you what, you know you got a mature church when it's as nasty as it is on the outside and there's still people showing up to be on the inside. Come on, somebody. Boy, I tell you what, y'all bless me today. I, I, I told Pastor Kayla, there's sometimes I wake up Sunday morning and I must not have much faith because I said, I hope you enjoy the message today because you might be the only one that's there. Because, boy, it's nasty outside. But, man, what a blessing it is to be with you today. If you are tuning in from home or wherever you are traveling, we thank you for joining us today because we are in week two of our brand new series entitled For Mature Audiences Only. And I shared with you a couple, y'all know about every time we launch a new series, I said this is going to be one of my favorite series. And, and every time it is, it keeps getting gooder and gooder. Hallelujah. But my, my English teacher from my high school's in the back. I ought not to say that. I'll say better and better. But, but you know, you know, I, I, I'm just so thankful that, we, uh, that we've been blessed with some great series. But I don't know if there's ever been a more timely series than the one we are engaging right now because, to be honest with you, immaturity is widespread throughout the body of Christ. If the last couple of years have revealed anything to us, it's that there are levels of immaturity, especially in particular areas of life, that the church needs to grow up in. And I'll say right now, it is not okay for the church to remain immature. The church is 2,000 years old. My goodness, we ought to be very mature. But, but unfortunately, what we've seen is many of us are operating in ignorance in areas of our lives. I didn't say stupidity. There's a difference. Stupidity means you don't have the capacity to know something. But ignorance simply means you lack information on something. And because we have been ignorant in certain areas, it has allowed us to remain immature. And I told you, seniority doesn't equal maturity. Just because you've been here a long time doesn't mean you've grown up. And the church is 2,000 years old, but sometimes we still act like we are in an infantile stage of life because there's certain things that need to be addressed in order for us to grow up and into everything God has designed us to be. And that's not, I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to grow us up. Amen. And so it's not, this is not to bring shame, guilt, condemnation to just pour it on. But it is, we, we, we know we must become aware of these things because you can only conquer what you confront. And we've got to confront it. We've got to identify it. We've got to talk about it in order to grow in these areas because it's one thing to be immature, but it's an entirely worse thing to remain immature. And immaturity represents irresponsibility. I want to say that again. Immaturity. How many of y'all know when you're, when you're a baby, when you're immature, when you're not grown up, you don't have any responsibilities, right? All you got to do is cry until somebody puts a bottle in your mouth, right? And, and so, so like you don't have responsibilities. But then when you get a little bit older, you get about two or three years old, you, you know, you, you realize that you, when you cry, nothing happens unless grandma's around and you get what you want. Glory to God. 
And then when you get a little older, when you cry, you get in trouble, right? Because you start to realize that like, as you as you supposedly mature, there is a level of responsibility. And when you're 10 years old, you don't go, I want my milk. And mama goes and gets your milk. You get up off the couch, off your blessed assurance to go get your own milk. Glory to God. Because that's what, that's what you do as you grow and as you mature, you have increased responsibility. And then you get to be my age and you can cry and nobody's listening anyway, so it don't matter. You know, you got to fix your own mess. So, 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 so it's important to recognize that with immaturity comes irresponsibility. And irresponsibility is an issue because you can't, if you are irresponsible, that means you are not trustworthy and you are not dependable. And it is not okay for us to be the body of Christ and to not be dependable and not be trustworthy. If we are going to be the ambassadors of the kingdom of God on the earth, then my God, we need to grow up and start acting like it. It is time for us to put away the stuff, the, all the silliness of immaturity and start acting like we are who God says we are. And so as we are embarking on this journey, it's important for us to recognize that it's not just in one area where we have immaturity, it's in several areas. And last week we kicked it off with our foundational message because I told you, I said, you, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta get the message right. If the message is immature, everything else is gonna be immature. So we started with the foundation and we talked about how we're mature in our message. And what that means is, as Paul writes and the author of Hebrews tells us, that if those who are, are, are considered to be mature are operating in the message of skilled they're skilled in the message of righteousness. In other words, if you understand you have been made righteous, faith righteous because of what you believe in, then you are considered to be a mature believer in your message. In other words, it's not about what I do. It's about what Jesus did. And it's all about whom I put my trust in. Do I put my trust in Brad who drops the ball from time to time? Or do I put my trust in Jesus who has never failed me and never will? Come on somebody. Who has never let me down and doesn't plan on doing it anytime soon. So it's important to recognize we must mature in our message and our message is faith righteousness. You are Right with God because of what Jesus did. Nothing more and nothing less. All you simply do is believe it and receive it. That is what a mature believer believes in their message. Today I want to talk about the fact that we need to mature in our minds. Mature in our minds. We got to get our thinking right if we're going to be mature believers. Because it doesn't matter. Have you ever seen somebody that appears to be in their 30s? But they act like they're seven. Don't point at them. Don't wink at them. Don't even head nod. Just look at me. But you know what I'm talking about. Somebody who's immature. And it's because, have you ever said, they, in fact, my wife has gently told me from time to time, you think like a kid. You think like a youngin. And I'll be like, well, Brevin's smart. She said, I wasn't talking about Brevin. I'm talking about Roman. He's two. <laughs> because sometimes our thinking shows just how mature we are or are not. And if we're going to be mature in the body of Christ, we have got to get our thinking right because there is too much immaturity in our thought processes when it comes to the body of Christ and how we function day to day. So stand to your feet. I want to read the opening scripture today. Just tell your neighbor, say, it's time to grow up. Tell them. Wouldn't it be nice if church was more like a, a kingdom boot camp and less like a daycare center? Come on, somebody. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm going to read verse 11, and we're going to probably read this every week. It's our foundational message, and this is what it says. When I was a child, Paul writes, when I was a child. He didn't say I still am. He didn't say I'm not planning on staying here. He said when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood like a child. I thought. As a child, but when I became a man, when I became a woman, when I became a mature believer in Christ, when I grew up, I put away childish things. Let me read it one more time. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things on your way down to your seat till about two or three people here we grow again. Come on, somebody. Now, if you've been around this church 
for any bit of time now, you have probably heard me talk about the significance of us being three-part beings. We consist of three parts as human beings. We are spirit, soul, and body. Specifically, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we dwell in a body. We are made up of three parts. We were created in the image of God. God has three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are three parts, spirit, soul, and body. And growing up, I never had any issues with the body part. I pretty much understood what that meant. I, you know, you, we, we, we have no, no problems when it comes to recognizing the functionality of the body aspect of our being. It's the thing we recognize, right? It's the thing that is probably most profound when it comes to our interaction with others because you know I, I can't tell necessarily when your spirit enters the room or even when your soul enters the room, but I can tell when your body enters the room. That's how we acknowledge the presence of each other because our body in essence is our tent suit. It is our earth suit that contains our spirit and our soul. It's what we see when we look at each other. It's what we work on when we stand in front of the mirror, come on somebody, and we flex and we pose or we hide depending on how you are, praise God. And it's what, it's what we oftentimes identify with when it comes to people we come in contact with and encounter. That is our body. The Greek word is soma. It literally means that, that the physical body you have been given. I never had an issue understanding that we're taught at a very young age in science class in biology that that you know, the functions of your body and each person has one and you need to take care of it. However, when it came to the soul and the spirit, I, I must say I lacked clarity. And part of that is because the, that we oftentimes use the two interchangeably, especially when it comes to our spirituality or our Christianity. So we say things like, praise God, today in church five souls got saved. When the truth of the matter is five souls didn't get saved, five spirits were born again. But I know the soul wasn't saved because the soul consists of the mind, will, and emotions, right? And their soul wasn't saved. It began a process of becoming all that God had created it, but immediately your soul didn't get fixed. Why? Because you can get saved today, but your mind is still jacked up tomorrow. And because I, I'm not interested in trying to fix it for the sake of semantics, but let me be honest. I think what happens is because language creates culture and culture helps define and determine how we think, because we have used these things interchangeably, and here's what happens. Joe comes down and receives the life of Christ and gets born again. But his soul is not completely born again. So next Friday, when we see Joe doing the same thing Joe's always done, even though he just got saved, we get upset and frustrated because we say, well, I guess Joe really didn't get saved. Why? Because he's still doing the same old stuff. The reason Joe's still doing the same old stuff is not because he's not a born again spirit. It's because his mind, his will, and his emotions have not had time to catch up to what his spirit has already realized. Because your spirit is transformed in a moment. That's an event. The salvation of your spirit is not a process. It's an event. But the transformation of your soul is a process. It is not an event. You don't just one day wake up and all of a sudden you think different. Now you may for a moment, you may start to say, oh, you know what, I'm seeing things differently, but you, don't, you just give yourself about 15 minutes and I promise you at some point you'll revert back into your old self. Because it's a process of constantly and consistently aligning my thoughts and my emotions and my understanding, my will and my reasoning to line up with who the Bible says I am. And if you think you're completely saved in your soul, just let me remind you, that time you lost your temper with your wife? Yeah, that's right. That ain't, your soul ain't saved. Come on, somebody. Your spot on the couch may be saved, but your soul ain't saved. So we have to recognize the difference between our spirit and our soul. Why am I saying this? Because if you fail to discern the difference between your spirit man and your soul, then you will even be brought into question your own salvation when you don't act like you should act. When you don't think like you should think. 
when you don't behave like you should. Baby, let me give you some Bible for that. I love what Paul writes to 1 Thessalonians. He's writing to the church of Thessalonica, and this is what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. He says, may God himself, the God of all peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, you have a spirit, You have a soul and you have a body. And God has come to bring perfection to all of them. The moment you got saved, you were given a brand new spirit. You are in the process of getting a brand new soul. And the Bible says in one day, in a glorious day, you will be given a brand new body. Somebody say, hallelujah. But you have all three components there. Another example, I love this, in Hebrews 4, verse 12, listen to this. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, for it penetrates, watch this, to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It divides, I love how he says that, it divides your soul and your spirit. If it divides the two, that means they aren't the same thing. And what he's saying there is the purpose of the word of God is it's got to cut. It's got to separate so you know what is your soul and what is your spirit. Because you are not designed to be led by the soul. For Romans 8, 14 says, for many who are led by the spirit, they are sons of God. You are not designed to be led by your soul. You are not to be designed to be led by your head. You are designed to be led by the heart God's put on the inside of you, also known as the Holy God. I feel like preaching in this place today. I can remember being in a water park. We took the youth to a water park in Greensboro, North Carolina, about died on ten years ago now. And as we were at that water park, I went up. They had the tallest. Boy, you know how the pastor? He, I got to prove to all them young people I got it going on. And boy, they had this one water slide, and it was straight down. Y'all ain't lying. That thing looked like it curved back inward. And I looked up at it and I said, I ain't going on that thing. And one of them youth said, Pastor, are you afraid of that thing? And I said, No, I ain't afraid. Let's go, boy. And I climbed that ladder and I got to the top. And I'll never forget this. I was standing at the top, you know, I was up there and I was trying not to be scared. <laughs> standing there in front of my about three youth who were up there on the top of that thing with me. Pastor Lewis will remember this because Sam and Justin were with me. We're up there on top of that slide and I looked and I was trying to analyze and everything. And looking at all the signs and the signs ain't nothing there to protect you. It's all there to scare the devil out of you. But a one sign right above the entrance of that slide, it said, do not enter head first. So I turned to the lifeguard and I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yes, sir. I said, why can't you enter head first? And he says, because going down head first will kill you. I thought that's a good answer. And I looked at that young man and said, don't worry, I'm not tempted. I was just curious. And I thought about that, you know. Life is the same way. You are not designed to live life head first. Because the Bible says a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. See, your soul consists in your mind, but your spirit is in your heart. I'm not talking about your blood pumping organ. I'm talking about the innermost being that God has created and designed and deposited into you. And that's where the spirit of God remains. And the problem with most of us is we're living life head first and it's killing us. Because you're only doing what you think you should do. And the road to logic is not the road of the kingdom. The road of logic doesn't lead you to build a boat when you've never even heard of rain before. The road of logic won't cause you to think that giving your life would save the life of others. But you best believe that being led by the Spirit is how we've been designed to lead. And Hebrews says, you have the purpose of the Word of God is to separate your soul from your spirit because you have to know what are your thoughts and you have to know what are God's thoughts. 
Because your thoughts are in your head, but God's thoughts are hidden in your heart. And if you don't know the difference, then you'll live life to the best of your ability instead of the best of God's ability. How can the Holy Spirit guide you if you're always operating according to your thoughts? We, we, we want to, oh, I just want to be led by the Spirit. I want, to, I, want to, I want to walk by faith. No, you don't. You want to walk by your own thinking. You know how I know that? Because if I asked you right now, what is God saying? All you're going to do is tell me everything you've seen. You know, people, people are making decisions right now based on what? What they're getting informed by. See, your soul gets informed by your five senses. What you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, and what you feel. So whenever you touch a hot stove, your mind receives information that whenever that sucker's red, it's hot. And so we, we, we amass information in our brain that has been received from the experience of our five senses. And so now I recognize, that, okay, I, I do this because I've, I've seen this before. Or, or, or the, but, but, but here's the problem. Well, well, okay, now I need to make sure that I don't, I don't really have relationship with the person because I've done it before and it hurt me. So I'm never going to cut the stove on again because I got burned by it. No, 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 listen. There's nothing wrong with the stove. You just got to use it for the right application. I, like I, I can have the stove on and I can still cook the beans without burning myself. Come on, somebody. But the problem is when you only operate in your soul, then you are limited to the wisdom of your experience only. You're only going to know what you've experienced or what you've been taught. But when we're led by the Spirit, by your heart, by what God's given you, then I'm not operating according to eyesight. I'm operating according to insight. And, and, and I'm not relying on bread to have the solution. I'm trusting in God that he does. Are y'all getting this? So it's important and imperative to recognize that my mind has the, 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 it has the ability to lead me astray. Paul recognizes this, which is why in his letter to, in, to the Romans, in chapter 12, verse 2, it's, he says this. I love this. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. He says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. I like the old King, the new King James, to the ways of the world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the pleasing, perfect will of God. See, Paul is saying, who is he talking to? He's talking to born again believers. He's not saying you need to get saved so you can think right. He's saying, hey, you're already saved, but you have got to get your thinking to align with God's truth because you can be just as saved as the day is long. But if your thought processes are still the old way of thinking, then you will not inhabit the kingdom. You, you're saved, sanctified, and going to heaven on the holy train. But your thinking's jacked up because your mind's not renewed. Now, I got to tell you, in about 2001, I memorized that verse when I was reading in a Bible study, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. Y'all remember that? And I thought when I read that, this is what I thought. Okay, what Paul's saying is don't think about worldly stuff. Don't think about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Don't think about money and stuff like that. Don't, he's saying don't think about worldly stuff. Think about heavenly stuff. Like salvation and peace. And think about that stuff. That's not what he's saying though. Paul is not addressing the objects of our thoughts. He's addressing the process of our thoughts. He doesn't say don't think about the things of the world. He says don't conform to the ways He's not talking about what you think about. He's talking about how you think. Yes, right. That's good. This is imperative for us to understand because if we don't get this right, 
we literally will live from the wrong place. So let me give you an example. So, 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 so the world's way, the pattern is do something, practice it, get good at it, and then become it. Right? That's how, that's how the world works. Okay, let me give you an example. If I'm going to run a marathon, I've got to start running. So I run a 3K and a 5K and a 10K and whatever Ks. I don't know how many Ks are on a marathon, but, but you keep running. And eventually, you're going to get to the capacity where you can become a marathon runner, right? That is the way the world works. Practice it, discipline yourself, and if you do it long enough and hard enough, eventually you'll become that. That's not how the kingdom works. But when you don't understand that, you apply the same pattern to your spirituality. So if I pray, and if I read my Bible, and if I go to church, and if I give, and if I serve, I'll become a Christian. Y'all ain't saying nothing, but I'm preaching good. That is the way of the world. The way of the kingdom is I am a believer who God says I am, and now I read, I give, I serve, and I do all those things not to become that, but because I'm already that. It's an entirely different way of thinking. Immature mindset is, well, I got to do more to get more. I got to do it to become it. I, I, lived, I lived the first half of my saved life like this, y'all. Where, well, I gotta, I, if I do more, then I'll become more. And Jesus is saying, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. So we end up working for stuff in order to become something instead of working from stuff, what we've already become. Because in the world, if I forgive, then I'm a forgiver. In the kingdom, I've been forgiven. So now I forgive. I don't love to become a lover. I am loved, so now I love. Are y'all getting this? I'm not doing it to become anything. That's the way the world works. Because the world defines you by what you do. God defines you by who you are. That's how, that's how it works. You're not a Christian because you do Christian stuff. I'm sorry. Some of y'all are like, praise God, because I don't do much Christian stuff. You're a believer, you're a Christian because of what Jesus did, not what you do. But if you don't get your mind aligned to that, then watch this. Not only will you not do the right stuff, but when you do the right stuff, it'll be from the wrong place. I know a lot of Christians who are really unselfish because they believe that they got to be that way because they're a Christian. So if, I'm, if, I'll just be, if I'll be unselfish, I'll be a good Christian. It's like, my God, that's exhausting because he ain't never going to get enough. And you're never going to give enough. No, instead of, instead of letting it flow from who you are, in the kingdom, doing always flows from being. Isn't that what God, God created you to be a human being, not a human doing? You're not defined by your activity. You're defined by your identity in Christ. And everything we do should flow from that. But that requires us to think differently. Because everything you've thought up to this point is opposite of what the kingdom... That's why Jesus said the kingdom is opposite of the culture. It is. He said, in, in culture, climb the ladder to get higher. In the kingdom, go lower. For whom you hump, who the, for those who humble themselves, God exalts. In the world, it's Ricky Bobby. If you ain't first, you're last. In the kingdom, it's whoever's last is first. You see it? It's completely different, but we have to renew our minds in order to inhabit that way of living. And most of us, because we spend six days in the world and one day in church. <laughs> Y'all ain't ready for that, but I'm going to say it anyhow. And we, we're so inundated with the culture of the world 
that what we've done, it's easier for us to just do our church thing the cultural way than it is for us to renew our minds despite what culture says. Now, what are some of the factors that affect the maturity of our mindsets? Let me, let me talk about this for a minute because a huge factor, and you need to know this, I just feel, I feel like the environment you're in plays a huge factor in the way you think. Huge way. I was sharing this with Donnie and I, years ago, back, we were still at the high school, I, I can remember. I didn't have as much time then to do as much research, but I would always say things like, a study shows, or it's a known fact. Now, I don't know that I had time to research this fact, but I remember giving this fact, so somewhere it's a known fact. And I said this, Wally, I said it's a known fact that you could take, I read this somewhere, that you could take a baby shark and put a baby shark in a small tank aquarium and it will only grow to a certain length. I can remember preaching this. It was a good sermon too. I'm not sure if this is true, but it was a good sermon. And I remember saying, but you can take the same shark and release it into the vast waters of the ocean and it will grow to full capacity because your environment often dictates your growth. And while your environment is by far not the only factor, I, I can tell you right now it is not the only factor because I've seen people who come from toxic environments but have grown into healthy beings because they had to make intentional choices to break free from generational curses that had them locked up. But let me just say, you must understand this because if you're not aware of it, you'll be bound by it. And your environment plays a huge role in how you think. It impacts your soul. Let me give you this example. Let's just say this afternoon you get out of church, get you some lunch, you're home hanging out, and you're like, you know what? You tell your spouse, we ought to go to the movies tonight. Let's go to the movies. So you go down to Wilmington and you go to the 715 showing of Scream, the horror movie. And you're sitting in that horror movie, watch this, and you're inside the theater and you're watching this horror movie. And everything in the atmosphere is designed to manipulate your thoughts and your feelings when you're watching the movie. So the lights are low. The music's playing eerily. The, the bass is thumping. You know, like a heartbeat. It's making your chest beat real fast. The, the viewpoints of the different camera angles are manipulated to only show you certain things to, to bring, you know, a certain level of anxiety. And you're, and you're watching this and, and all of a sudden you're going, no, 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 whatever you do, don't go, don't go up the stairs. And then they start to go, and you see the bad guy coming, and you know the, the murder. And, and what do you do? You're covering your eyes, or you're burying your head in the shoulder of your spouse. Now, now let me say, do you know how ridiculous that is? Because there is a zero percent chance that the person with the knife on that screen is coming to get you. Like, what in the world are you hiding from? It's, it's nuts. And the bad thing is we pay to do that. <laughs> so why is it, Gary, that I know, I know, I've never sat in a movie and thought to myself, this may happen to me right now, but, but why is it that we allow ourselves to go there? <laughs> you know, even though we know in our heart of hearts that it's not real. It's because your environment oftentimes dictates your thoughts. And you want to think because you show up to church two and a half times a month. That's the average. That's why I said two and a half times. I know you can't come to a half a day at church, but that's the average. That all of a sudden your thoughts are just going to be the thoughts of God. When every single day your thoughts are being bombarded and manipulated by environments that do not represent the kingdom of God? Oh, but I, I'm, a, I'm a mature believer. No, you're not. If you think for one minute those things don't matter, you're wrong. You're wrong. So, so what are you saying, Pastor? We shouldn't ever go to work? No, go to work. Go to work, get paid, pay your bills, tithe, all that good stuff. You ought to do that. 
But you have to be aware of how external things will manipulate your mind. Because to be ignorant of it is not to be immune from it. So what we have to do is we have to be intentional, Tylen, about getting ourselves in environments where thought processes that are of God are conducive. That's why it's important to assemble together in church. It is. It's important. There's a reason the Bible says do not forsake the assembly of saints. It's because this matters. It does. I heard somebody say, well, you know what? COVID showed people, COVID showed people that church really didn't matter. The devil is a lie. You know what COVID showed me? Church does matter because a lot of the people that used to be in environments where they were growing because they were removed from it now are, have major struggles. And I'm not saying church attendance is the answer. I'm saying putting yourself in environments where your faith is stirred. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Watch this. Fear comes by hearing everything except the word of Christ. So whatever you're tuned into is going to help determine the temperature of your faith. And we want to be people of faith. I want to have peace when chaos comes. And the moment chaos comes, you're running for the hills. I want to have unspeakable joy no matter what happens. But the moment things fall apart, so do we. Like you, we, you know why? Because we're not mature in our thinking. Because we're not having the mind of Christ. We're having the same thought, thought, the same thought patterns of the world. So the sky is falling. And instead of us saying, no, it's not, we become chicken little too. <laughs> and then we get spiritual with it. Well, the sky is falling. Well, Jesus must be coming back. <laughs> it's nuts. You've been given kingdom, dominion in the earth, and you're whining about the skies falling? I can't, well, boy, I tell you what, you better not miss the last week of this series because I'm dealing with maturing in our media because I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the mess I've seen on social media that Christians are posting, it's nuts. Because we're so immature. We th- immediately, what we're doing, you know, oh, the sky's falling, Jesus must be coming back, so it must be a sign of the time. D- listen, Jesus has been coming back for decades. Yeah. My God, all we need is one more blood moon to show us Jesus is coming back. My God, you know when Jesus will come back? When he's daggum ready. Yes, Stop trying to figure it out and start living it out. Yeah. We have got to mature in our thinking. I got about 90 seconds to give you three points. I can't do it. Y'all lie. <laughs> it is time for us to mature in our thought processes. So let me just end. I got, I got four points, actually four. So anyway. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to give you the four points. I'm not going to elaborate on the time, but I'm going to give you these four points because the OCD people, you need it or you won't sleep tonight. <laughs> so I'm going to give you these four points, but I want to challenge you in this, and I mean this. What are the unhealthy thought patterns of your life that are perpetuating things that are not the fruit of the Spirit? So I want you to ponder. I know it's somewhat of a deep question, but... What are, the, what are the thought patterns in your life that are constantly producing fruit that is not fruit of the Spirit? So, so, so what's going on? What thoughts are you having that are constantly producing fear? What thoughts are you having that are constantly producing hurry instead of patience, impatience? What, what thoughts are you having that are not producing love but anger? Because here's what you got to do. You have got to change your thought pattern. And if that means changing your environment, then you got to start changing your environment. You don't have to insulate yourself from the world, but you do need to be aware of what it is you're facing so you don't become, because what happens is we don't realize the impact it's having on us. Because we, we're like, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I watch, where I'm at, where I go, what I miss. It does matter. It matters. If it didn't matter, I would not be doing a gospel circle in Wilmington tomorrow night. Because I'm not looking for something to do on a Monday night. 
I'd be all right staying home watching football if it was about what I wanted to do. But the reason it's important is because we have to continually pursue opportunities to be in environments where our faith is stirred and our soul is growing. So let me give you these four things. This is four quick practices in order to mature in our mind. Number one is this, and I'm going to move quick, so just use your Calvary app. You can get the notes there. Number one, the first thing you got to do is you must trust that you are who God says you are. Can I tell you right now, the sign of a mature believer is one that gets to a place where you'll begin believing God's voice over your own. Last week I talked about how faith righteousness is us putting our trust in God, not in us. But I'm going to tell you where we we really struggle is we believe our own voices more than we believe God's. So you can talk yourself into believing you're less than what God says you are because you believe you more than you believe God. You've got to get to a place where you actually trust that you are who God says you are. Number one is this. God can't lie. Number two, God says a lot of good things about you. So number three, you need to just trust what God says about you. I know nobody in here would raise their hand if I said, who's smarter than God? But the reality is you live your life like you're smarter than God. Because you know more about you than God does. Yeah, but God, God, you're righteous. Yeah, but you don't understand. I got upset this week. Yeah, but you know, you're, you're right with me. Yeah, but I, I lost my temper with my wife. Yeah, but you don't understand what I'm saying. And, and we're always arguing with God in, our, in the inner depths of our soul because we really don't believe we are who God says we are. You must trust that you are who God says you are. Number two is this. You've got to learn to take thoughts captive. You've heard the verse, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Okay. Listen to me, church. We take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. I love what the the New King James says. To bring it under the obedience of Christ. Now here's what you need to understand. Number one is this. It's not your obedience. It's the obedience of Christ. It's not what you've done or hadn't done. It's about what Jesus did. That is, that is the number one thought that ought to reign supreme over your being. Is what Jesus says because his obedience was perfect. He didn't mess up. He ain't going miss to the, miss the mark. He's right every time. So I have to recognize that in the hierarchy of my thoughts, what Jesus thought, his obedience, is number one. Okay? So that means every other thought that crosses by that exalts itself against the truths of what God says, I've got to capture that thought and I've got to submit it. That means put it under. That's what submit means to bring it under. Submit it under the obedience of Christ and say, this will not be the prevailing thought in my thinking. What God said is, so I got to take that thought and I got to put it down the list. Are y'all getting this? That is, liter- that is not a passive stance. It's an active stance. You have to be intentional about that because if you just let them all linger, they'll just kind of all float around and then bing, bing, they're bouncing off in, inside your head because you know it's hollow, praise God. But it's bouncing around and then, oh, there's another thought. Oh, there. Have you ever sat there and thought to yourself like, man, where did that thought come from? Oh my gosh, I, I, I used this example before. I was literally riding down the street one time in my car in my Jeep Cherokee. I'll never forget this. And there was a kid on a bicycle and I'm riding along and I thought, wonder what he would do if I just went over there and boom, just ran over and kept right on going. And I went, my God, what am I, what am I thinking? What, am I even saved? <laughs> Newsflash, that was not my thought. That didn't originate with me. That is the enemy. The enemy has the, has the ability to just put thoughts out there. Because thoughts are developed anytime we have an idea of something. Just because the thought crossed your mind doesn't make it your thought. How many of y'all have ever had somebody come visit your house? Anybody? How many, how many times when they came to visit your house did they park in your driveway? 
so you've had other people's cars in your driveway. How many of y'all know that just because it was parked in your driveway, it wasn't your car? Right? Just, cause, just because it's parked in your driveway doesn't mean it's yours. Just because the thought crosses your mind doesn't mean it's yours. So you've got to take any thought captive and say, you know what? I'm trusting what Jesus said. The obedience of Christ. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice and substitute. And because he became my sin, I have been made his righteousness. That settles it. Amen. But if you don't make that the, the prevailing thought, you'll be all over the place. That's why we live schizophrenic lives as believers because, well, today, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. God loves you. You can take that to the bank. That ain't never gonna change. He's happy with me, he's mad at me. He's happy with me, he's mad. He's, he's happy, he's madly in love with you. He's not mad at you. You know why? Because your disobedience was covered by the blood of Jesus. That doesn't mean there's not consequences because anytime you have sin, there's consequences to it. But it's not, it doesn't have consequences to your relationship with God. So you've got to take it and make it, a, make it captive, submit it to the obedience of Christ. Number three is this. After you do those things, now you've got to start fixating your mind on heavenly things. Colossians 3 says this, verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you have died and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. Set your mind on things above. On pe- Stop worrying about the election or the news or the economy. I'm not saying you got to be ignorant of those things, but stop worrying about those things. Start fixing your mind on, on, on what's above. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. My 401k, my God, another year like this, I won't even have a K. Okay, but does your daddy own the cat on a thousand hills? And all the silver and gold is, 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 is his? Like, is he not provided up to this point? I'm not saying, you know, you shouldn't check your portfolio. But at the end of the day, like, who are you trusting in? You got you to start fixing your eyes on what matters. Fixing your eyes on what matters. So, so, so and I love this. Because not only does it say, fix your mind on things above. He says, you died, and now your life is hidden with Christ. I want you to think about this for a moment. It doesn't mean you're hiding from Christ. It means you're hidden in Christ. So that means I can't see Gary anymore. I can only see Gary in Christ. So all the stuff you're, oh, I'm worried about. I got some stuff going on. I got some issues and everything. It's hidden in Christ. You're perfected in him. So when God sees you, he doesn't look at all the bad stuff. He goes, look, there's my beloved in Christ in whom I'm well pleased. Because you're hidden in Christ. That's what the Bible says. Don't look at me like I'm giving you some new age mess. That's what the Bible says. Fix your mind on things above. Watch this. Number four is this. Stand to your feet. I'm done. And this is a big one. Because the only way to get your mind right is to keep it right. So number four is this. Work out your salvation. Work out your salvation. What? Look, look what our parentheses. Not for your salvation. Work out your salvation. See, when you when you reprogram your mind, and you're starting to fix it on heavenly things and all these other thoughts, you've taken obedience to the mind of Christ, and you're you're getting yourself right. You need to start understanding the deposit God made on the inside of you. I don't miss this. If you miss it, don't don't miss this right here. Listen. Paul says, work out of you what God has worked in you. What does he mean by work out your salvation? You know, a lot of you, because we're in the first half of the first month of the year, you had New Year's resolutions, right? And some of the resolutions of people in here were probably, I want to I wanna work out in the gym, you know, every day. Praise God. When you go to the gym, what do you do at the gym? Work out. Two things. You work out and you take gym selfies. Apparently everybody does. But anyway, you work out. All right? The reason you work out is because you're trying to build what? Muscle. I need to help you understand this right here. 
Can I, let me just be your biology teacher for just a moment. Whenever you work out at the gym, you're not getting muscles that you don't have. You're actually discovering muscles you didn't know you had. You don't go work out and they don't give you muscle injections. What you have, you already have. But as you work it out, you don't receive muscles. Watch this. You reveal muscles. So when you work out, you're actually bringing, you're bringing out something that you already have. When it comes to your salvation, working out your salvation doesn't mean I'm getting more salvation. It means I'm starting to flex what I've already got. And the more you work out, the more that's in there gets revealed. And you start losing some of the stuff that's covering up the muscles. And start revealing all that stuff that was actually in there. Some of y'all going, I didn't even know I had that. So, so, so isn't it amazing like when you, when you start the journey and you start working out and, and you know, you're putting in the work, you're putting in the work and you're like, every day you look in the mirror like, oh man, I don't really see that much difference. I don't really see that much difference. But then you go somewhere and somebody goes, man, you must be working out. And you go, yeah. Yeah, Thank you for noticing. And see, it's hard for us because we have different reference points. Because when you look in the mirror, your reference point is the last time you looked in the mirror, which was yesterday. So from Thursday to Friday, not a whole lot changed. But their reference point was they saw you a month ago, before Christmas. So when they see you, they're like, oh, man, there's a big difference because they have a different reference point. And like it feels good when people can see the results of actually what was inside of us all along that now we've uncovered. And I, I was just thinking, I was like, what wonder what I, I, how cool it would be, Pastor Jamal, if we treated our salvation the same way we do our muscles. Can you imagine walking in a place? And man, you've just been, you know what you've been doing? You've been working your salvation out. You've been, you've been actually in the word of God, reading what God says is true about you. And you've been taking in, you've been studying, you've been reading it. Like every day you've been like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be consistent with it. I'm going to read. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like reading, but I'm, I'm going to read. I'm going to read Paul's letters and how he describes how God sees me. I'm going to read it every day. You know what you're doing every time you're reading it? Those are reps. Or I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray. Well, what, if, what if people came up to you and said, man, You've been working out. And you're like, yeah. And they're like, no, no, not like that. Like, I, I don't know that you've been doing this, but I, it looks like you've been doing this. It looks like you've been doing this. It looks like, it looks like you've been doing this. Because now what was originally on the inside of you has started to be revealed because I'm working out of me what God has worked in me and see you won't notice it as much day to day but you're going to be sitting in your office one day at your desk and somebody's going to walk up and go hey hey you got a second you go, come on yeah what's what you got come in and they're going to sit down and be like oh, man I'm in, a, I'm in a bad spot I'm really struggling like with this or that or the other like and and, and I know you, you may not know me well, but like, there's just something different about you. And, and I'll watch you, and, and I need what you got. And you're going to be sitting there going, really? Because you don't even see it in yourself. Because you just looked in the mirror yesterday. But they've seen the change, and they say, and that peace you got, that joy that you like everything's going on crazy and you're just like calm or everybody's upset we got some bad news and you're like still upbeat like what is that oh 
this is Christ in me, my hope of glory. But the problem is, if you never work it out, they'll never see it. Oh, you'll have it. You got your salvation. Whether you work it out or not, you got it. But it ain't going to help others. They can't see it. get your thinking right I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing it to become a better Christian I'm not I, I'm, I'm as a good a Christian today as I ever will be because my Christianity my alignment with God is completely and solely based on the obedience of Christ and that's it I'm never going to be more righteous or more holy or not. I'm, I'm, I'm as holy as I'll ever be but my ministry to others will always be filtered through the being of me they encounter we got to change the way we think our whole thought process because if we'll do that and get our alignment our mind in alignment with God's promises it changes the game you know what that is that's the sign of a mature believer when you mature in your mindset Father I thank you today and I just thank you, Lord, for your goodness that is on display every time we turn around. How you bless us beyond measure, expectation, and certainly what we deserve. Lord, I thank you that as we take this journey and process this immaturity out of our lives in every area of it, that we continue to grow into all things you've created us to be. That we're not trying to get something we don't have. We're revealing what we already have by working it out and trusting in you so that at the end of it all, you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Love you. God bless you. Have a safe trip home. See you tomorrow night at Gospel Circle in Wilmington, y'all. Have a great day.